first stand. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome everyone to our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting tonight. And we are so privileged to have a very distinguished speaker, a very good friend, and a trendsetter in uh, both musculoskeletal ultrasound, interventional ultrasound, regenerative medicine, or what have you there. And uh, he's been all over the place, all over the world, teaching, training, and discussing so many new things in, uh, in this practice. And uh, I cannot introduce him any farther because all of you knows him very well. And uh, I might commit a mistake because I might miss some of his uh, very important uh, titles. He's got a very long title. I cannot uh, mention it anymore. He's just got a lot, a long list of titles everywhere. But uh, he's a very good brother and a very good friend. And we are so happy that we can uh, listen to one of the best in ultrasound and interventional, I would say, in all the world. How is that, Brother Stan? It's good. It's good. Okay, so, uh, but before we begin, let me uh, pray first so we can all be on the, on the same page. So let us bow our heads for a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful evening, and we thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity that... Uh, we can come together tonight to listen to our brother, Dr. Stanley Lam from Hong Kong. And we are so happy that uh, he finds time in sharing his expertise and knowledge in spite of, her, of his busy schedule. And he would like Lord, to pray for everyone wherever we are in different parts of the world. As we listen and learn from him, may your grace and your Holy Spirit be upon us tonight. Can he be with us, O oh God? And Make us safe wherever we are and forgive our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you the best, the only Dr. Stanley Lamb. Go ahead, Brother Stanley. Thank you, Dr. Jim, for your um, kind and warm introduction. And uh, it is my honor and pleasure um, to share with you the ultrasound guided interventions about spine. And this today, tonight, I'm going to focus mainly on thoracic spine. So you are seeing that my sharing screen right now is uh, the anatomy. So because uh, a lot of our um, knowledge uh, the sonal anatomy and uh, interventions are based on the anatomy. So when I when we look at when we cut through the skin here, in fact, I think there is one more layer uh, uh, after the skin. You have sub cube, and um, and then uh, after the sub cube, then you have uh, the up to trapezius. So the trapezius will be um, a, a layer of muscle from your occiput and all the way to T12. But in between, a lot of time when you see in the patient, real patients, that uh, the trapezius, the lower trapezius does not stop at the T, um, T12. Is a lot of patients they have very thin trapezius, lower trapezius, and they will stop at about T9, T10 and sometimes um, the strongest person may have uh, like a T11 or T12. And closing to the lower end of that um, scapula, and then you have um, this latissimus dorsi muscle, and then holding that the lower end of the uh, scapula, and that's a little bit deeper than that of the um, insertion of the uh, lower trapezius. But this is, uh, when you go to the, the real scanning, you're going to see a lot of variation of this, but 
at least you need to know the anatomy, the thin, the most superficial layer apart from the fascia and the subcutaneous fat. And the first muscle you're going to see is the trapezius and the latissimus dorsi in the thoracic region. So that's the, the one thing you have to remember because um, other, if you don't know this anatomy relationship, when I do the scanning, you will be lost, okay? So let me take away this um, trapezius. After taking away the trapezius, I was just trying to move this to the center here. Home, okay. After taking away the trapezius and what the, the layer, if you're still within the scapula, interscapular region, the next layer deeper to the trapezius will be the rhomboid. Okay, remember this relationship. So the two layers of muscle in between the scapula, the, the most superficial is the trapezius, deeper to that is your rhomboid. And the rhomboid, it depends on whether the insertion is to the, um, to the spine of the scapula or is to the scapula. If the insertion is to the spine of scapula, and then that would be the rhomboid minor. If the insertion is to the medial edge of the scapula, and then that would be the rhomboid major. So we will remember this relationship. And after the rhomboid, there is also one more layer of muscle originate from the spinous process of um, two to five. And um, is inserting to the second to the fifth rib. So this is the serratus posterior superior muscle. The reason you need to know this is your dorsal scapular nerve is superficial to the insertion of the serratus posterior superior. Very important. So if you know how to find the serratus posterior superior muscle, it is not difficult at all to get the dorsal scapular nerve right away because the dorsal scapular nerve is right superficial and lateral to the insertion of your serratus posterior superior. Medial to your serratus posterior superior um, muscle here, and then that will be your posterior cutaneous branch of your intercostal nerve. That, would, that is another entrapment point for the, um, because people presenting with interscapular pain uh, over the thoracic uh, spine area here, you have to remember one of the differential diagnoses is dorsal scapular nerve entrapment. The second one is if that, that is coming from the thoracic spine and then that will, and the dorsal scapular nerve is usually the problem is from the first, second rib or the cervical spine. But if the problem is really due to local, and then you need to look for the intercostal nerve posterior cutaneous branch, which is surface right medial to the insertion of the serratus posterior superior. Remember, medial to the serratus posterior, serratus posterior superior insertion is your posterior cutaneous branch of your intercostal nerve and then lateral to the insertion of this group of muscle is your dorsal scapular nerve. So both one medial and one lateral. So these are two entrapment points. And then if you're going to see more meat deeper to that, remember this serratus posterior superior muscle and then also traveling in a different direction than the layer of layers of muscle underneath. Take a look at the layers of muscle underneath is going um, all the way vertically up. And then so the, the first group of layer of muscle, usually you're going to see, it depends on the, which is uh, uh, more cranial or is more caudal, is the iliocostalis. Is the iliocostalis thoracis, or if you're going to more caudal, is your iliocostalis lumborum. Okay, so these are the, the just, lat uh, just deeper to the insertion of your uh, serratus posterior superior. And if you go more medial to, to, to this uh, iliocostalis muscle, you have your longissimus, and you have a longissimus thoracis, or, and even you have a longissimus cervices, or sometimes called the longissimus coli. And 
if you are, if I go more even more medial, and then you have more, your splenius coli, splenius surfaces, and then uh, so this is and it's, so splenius surfaces is this, exactly the same name as uh, so, uh, splenius coli, and uh, and after that more cranial you have your splenius capitis. So deeper to that layer of muscles, and then you have your semispinalis and or spinalis. Okay, semispinalis thoracis, uh, semispinalis capitis, and uh, splenius, semispinalis uh, surfaces. All these muscles are deeper to the splenius. And after this, and then you are going to have, even take away, the spinalis, and then, then you have finally you have your multifidi muscle. So the multifidi muscle is all the way from your sacrum and then up to cervical spine. So the, these muscles are connecting all the way from sacrum to the uh, cervical spine here. And underneath your multifidi, you have your rotatoris muscle, this very small muscle. So remember that. And then going back to one more layer, and then I would like to say, see this multifidi muscle, in fact, covering all the facet joint and all the transverse process. So remember this. And also the transverse process is bothly covered by the multifidi and also the semi, uh, the, the uh, semispinalis and also the, uh, the splenius and also the, uh, the longissimus. So these transverse process, remember, is a money short area, the transverse process of all those uh, thoracic vertebrae. And remember, your medial branch to the facet joint is also over your transverse process. So talk so much about this. And then let's go back to my handout. Oops, I cannot share. Okay, so let me uh, share this um, lecture here. Okay. Okay, let's talk about. Okay, can you see the slides clearly? Yes, yes, uh, Doctor. Okay. Yes. So, uh, thoracic skeletal landmarks. I would also like to to, pay, uh, to like you to pay attention is comparing to the cervical spine here. Spinous process to the facet from cervical spine is two finger breadth of the patient. Patient's finger breadth, not to your finger. Okay, use the patient's finger to measure that. For the thoracic spine, instead, is only one finger breadth from the spinous process to the to the uh, facet joint. And also, just next to the facet, you have your uh, all uh, the transverse process. And also, take a look at the relationship of the ribs and the transverse process. The ribs are a little bit more cranial than the transverse process when you're looking at the costal transverse joint. So the rib is a little bit more cranial than that. Okay, and let's take a look at. So the rib is a little bit cranial than the, than the uh, transverse process over the um, costal transverse joint. And when we look at the uh, in medial, edge, medial edge of your scapula, one finger breath, patient's finger as well, usually you're going to find your dorsal scapular nerve. And your dorsal scapula artery is usually more lateral to that, okay? And this is also the insertion part for the serratus posterior superior. So this is, uh, I'm drawing the relationship uh, to you. Spinous process, the facet, and the transverse process, and all the ribs. And then remember the first two ribs are going to the front, and then the third, and then fourth, fifth, and then they are more horizontal. And, and Dr. Stan, your yes. slide is not moving. Slides are not, not moving. Yeah. How about now? Yes, yes, yes. That's better. Okay. So one, so can you see the previous slide? 
this, this, this two, this few. Okay, just just a uh, very quick repeat. If you use patient's finger here, okay, patient's finger, one finger breath from the spinous process will be the transverse process, will be this uh, facet joint and lateral, just lateral to that you have your transverse process. And then looking at the ribs at the costal transverse joint, and the ribs is a little bit more cranial than the um, transverse process. So that's, re remember this relationship when you're going to scanning, you're going to find, easily find how you are looking at um, the costal transverse joint and also the ribs. And also patients one finger breath from the medial edge of the scapula, you're going to find the dorsal scapular nerve. And that's also the insertion for the serratus posterior superior from the second to the fifth rib. In fact, that fascial plane is also exist over the first rib, but just you do not see the insertion of the muscles. And then when you look at the, this insertion of this, remember lateral to the insertion, you have a dorsal scapular nerve and you're more lateral, you have a dorsal scapular artery. When you're going back to more medial to the insertion of serratus posterior superior, you have the posterior cutaneous branch of that intercostal nerve trying to surface that and then going to piercing through the serratus posterior superior to surface and supplying the skin. So that's a, a very important entrapment point. So looking at this, oops, looking at, this is the joint, the relationship, medial edge of that. Remember the spine of scapula corresponding to the rhomboid minor right here. And the rhomboid major is over this medial edge. And this, this is the one finger breath from the medial edge. You are seeing that um, the dorsal scapular nerve. And the cranial to the medial edge of the spine of scapula here, you're going to see the levator scapular attachment. And the first two ribs are pointing cranial. And the lower ribs are pointing caudal. And uh, one finger breath, you have your facet joint and also the costal transverse joint and the transverse process. And remember, uh, if you do any interventions, unless you are doing, you're knowing the anatomy, your needle should not point in lateral. Okay, so one finger breath, one finger breath. Okay, let's talk about the first, uh, uh, I'm trying to show you the anatomy here. So I'm scanning from um, the, cranial to caudal. And uh, this is a transverse scanning here. So you are seeing the transverse process, uh, the lamina and the facet joint and the epidural space. And you also see the ribs, ribs, and the transverse process, facet and the uh, dura. So if dura, and let me stop. Let me slowly go in one by one, the, the, the anatomy uh, going together with you. This is at a level of what's, uh, first or second um, T1 or T uh, or T2. And <coughs> this is the, this is the tra transverse process. And you're also seeing that at this point, by this pointing direction, you are seeing the spinal cord. So this is pretty much, I'm sure, this is about C7 and T1 level. And then you have you have also seen the epidural space and also the, the posterior dura and, uh, and the posterior dura and also the epidural space, ligamentum flamen. And outside you are seeing that you have rotatoris in this fascial layer here. And the multifidite muscle is covering all this. And then you have your Remember at this point, you have your semi-spinalis um, capitis and surfaces all within that uh, layer of muscle here. And then outside that, you also have uh, another layer is called the splenius. I have lectures. And the surfaces, splenius capitis is all, all, over, all over the, the medial edge and the lateral to superficial to that. And also one muscle which is more um, 
on this still over the transverse process here, you also have your logismus muscle here. So it's very attached one end to here and the other end is usually to the costal transverse joint and also the ribs. And even outside, you have uh, another layer of, um, of muscle already. You, you're seeing here is the levator scapulae muscle here. And you have a trapezius muscle, upper trapezius muscle, also very superficial to that. Okay, and remember this fascial plane here over the first rib. Okay, I'm going to stop here for the time being. Okay, now I'm seeing that more clearly. Uh, the oops, cannot stop. Okay, now I'm seeing a little bit more clear that I'm seeing here, and this is um the layers you can see upper trapezius. This is at about the second rib and or the second uh, T2 level here. And then you are seeing this because uh, this is the levator scapulae, upper trapezius, and uh, you are also seeing the iliocostalis, longissimus, and then you have your splenius, and you also have your um, semispinalis, and you have your multifidi muscle, and then rotatorius muscle, very deep to that. And then if I keep going more, a little bit more, then the caudal, then you are seeing this is one costal transverse joint. And then usually you are going to see the rib first, then the transverse process. If you're scanning like that, so rib first and, and, then, and then transverse process. And also at this point, you also see one of these uh, ligamentum flavum, posterior dura, spinal cord, your anterior dura, and the posterior longitudinal line and uh, uh, ligament and also the, the vertebra. And at this point, and I remember some of this is a very, and uh, sp spinalis is, uh, is, if you're going more caudal, you're going to later on, you're going to see spinalis, but more cranial in the thoracic spine, you are seeing that, um, um, let me connect my power. My power is running low. Okay. So the money short area here, facet joint is should be here. Epidural space should be here. Facet. And then also you are seeing the transverse process. And remember the transverse process, you have your multifidi muscle, your semispinalis muscle, your splenius muscle, your longissimus muscle, all attached to the transverse process and your medial branch is also trying to surface around here. So all these area, this is a money short area from the costal transverse joint all the way to the lamina. So these are the area of all the muscle attachment. Super, oops, super important. So if I keep going down, now this time you can see that um, transverse process, transverse process, rib, and all those muscles, you see in that transverse process, costal transverse joint, and you are seeing that the uh, facet and epidural space is more medial to that. And if you keep scanning down, you can see that the semispinalis is, uh, is pretty much gone but you are going to see very close to the spinous process is there is another muscle uh, 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 coming in, which is the spinalis muscle as well. And at this point, you can see that the longest muscle is, longest is getting bigger and um, over the transverse process. But at this layer, I would like to show you that, oops, just go to the, I want to move this up a little bit, yes. And uh, then I go to the lower one here. So remember, at this point, you are seeing this is the lower trapezius. Another layer deeper to that is your rhomboid. And very, you keep going looking at this lower trapezius. Keep your eye over the lower trapezius. And then very soon, you're going to see 
on here, if there is another layer of muscle coming in, which is in fact the starting, especially over the lower end of that uh, scapula, then you're going to see the, the uh, latissimus dorsi muscle coming in. So this is the lower trapezius is already inserted. Can you see a layer of muscle inserting to the spinous process right here? Right here. Right here. So in fact, this one, this layer of muscle, it's, you need to, be, to pay attention whether this is keep going down, it is getting smaller or smaller, then you, you, you know that this is still the lower trapezius. But if this muscle is getting wider and then thicker, and then that should be your latissimus dorsi muscle. And this, why I bring this to be these two muscles up? These two muscles are the frequently neglected part of the thoracic spine scanning. Okay, people only pay attention to the facet joint, to the transverse process, to the ribs, but they do not pay any attention to the very superficial layer of muscle here. So remember, this is the almost gone. In fact, I haven't gone to T12. This is only T10 or, or T9. It's no more lower trapezius. This is only a fascial plane of um, muscle here, and then this, which is a continuation of the lower trapezius tendon. But this layer of muscle here is the latissimus dorsi now. Okay. This time I'm going to try to show you that uh, by, by doing this, I'm scanning the costal transverse joint, one costal transverse joint, and then I'm going to show you when I go to the second, you're going to see the serratus posterior superior muscle here. This is the serratus posterior superior muscle, and it is going to attach to that second rib right here. So when it's attached to the second rib, a lateral to that, you have your, the dorsal scapula, the medial to that, you have your posterior cutaneous branch of your intercostal muscle. And then um, you have your insertion of the um, levator scapula into the scapula here, and deeper to the levator scapula and lateral to the serratus posterior superior insertion is your serratus anterior muscle here. And you have your rhomboid minor just seeing and it is blending together with insertion of the lower trapezius on, um, over the lower end of the uh, levator scapulae. And if you go more cranial, and then now you're still seeing that, we're going to the first rib now. Can you see that this is still a fascial plane of your serratus posterior superior, but you do not see a muscle here. And you see the, the transverse scapular artery, which is, has not been changed the name to dorsal scapular nerve. And it's going to when you when the rib and it, when it reach the second rib, it changed the name to be a dorsal scapular artery. And at this point, you're still seeing that this is the top end of your uh, iliocostalis, longissimus, and transverse process is right here. So this is a money short area. And in fact, we call this one is the subtrapezial uh, plexus area because you have a lot of spinal accessory nerve and a little bit of dorsal scapular nerve and posterior cutis nerve of the intercostal nerve and, um, and also the uh, lateral branch, medial, uh, intermedial branch and medial branches all, all over this fascial plane here. Super important um, layer of fascia and uh, which is a lot of entrapment and people presenting with um, the upper shoulder and the root of the neck pain and then you are going to treat all of this. So you can see this is the serratus posterior superior insertion here and su superficial to that you have your rhomboid minor and you keep going down then you're going to see uh, the vitus scapula is gone then you're going to see the rhomboid major coming in in a more cortical cortical level and then this is uh, the dorsal scapular artery and you're going back to the costal transverse joint and you have seen all the muscles here and also remember the transverse process i say that again and again this is a transverse process is so important because it has longissimus you have your splenius you have semispinalis uh, you have your motividae all attached to the transverse process
So this is already going to that one point major area. And also remember, can you take a look at this? Uh, I would like, like you to focus on this muscle attachment to the scapula. This is scapula. Can you see me? This is muscle. The muscle is not attached like this, not like this. The muscle, even the rhomboid, even the levator scapulae, minor, rhomboid major, they are attached to the scapula by this, not by this. Okay, holding it. Okay. And sagittal view, and I remember that when you see this is uh, the muscle longitudinal, these are the muscle running from caudal to cranial. And this is the rib. And if I keep more going more medial, and then soon you are seeing that uh, the changes in the direction of the muscles because the muscle going in different direction. If you go tilting the pro more medial, you're seeing the epidural space, epidural space, epidural space. Don't go there, okay? Unless you know you're deliberately doing some. And then, but if the probe is straight down, then you see the facet, facet, tilting, epidural space, epidural space. So this is um. Just to remind you that tilting medial epidural space, probe stand straight, facet, facet, facet. Over that, you have your small muscle, usually it's the rotatoris, and then all superficial to that, have your multivitae, and above that, semispinalis, and above that, splenius, and above that, you have a rhomboid, or oh, as uh, you it still have first layer, it's usually a serratus posterior superior, then your rhomboid and trapezius. So if I go more to that transverse process here, right here. Oops, this is already another one. Never mind. So. I just want to show you that the relationship of that, um, if you tilt your probe uh, pointing lateral, then you're going to see um, the rib and the pleura right here. See that rib? Can you see the trans transition from a This is the rib. And that's the transverse process. Transverse process. Rib. The right side is cranial. The left side is caudal. So can you see that? I'll go back just a tiny bit. This is the transverse process. That's the rib. So rib is a little bit more cranial than the transverse process. This is the transition area you're going to see from the rib to transverse process and then to, to the rib, more cranial, and transverse process, more caudal. Okay, and then I go more, even more medial, and then you see the facet. Then I, if I tilt the probe pointing medially, then you see the epidural space. Okay, so if I go even more, um, you, you can see all the epidural space and even the spinal cord down. Okay, so if I go back to the transverse process and back to the rib, and then I hope you can see my probe angle. This time is more tilting lateral. And then you see the, um, the rib and then also the pleura and also the in uh, all the intercostal muscle here. So the, this is uh, once again from this um, set and then um, epidural space. And even I can go to this, uh, the spinous process here. You have the supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament. Then you have the spinalis muscle, or also the splenius, uh, and then also the semispinalis, and also the uh, multivitae muscle, rotatoris. It's all attached. To the lamina and if i keep going and you see that is this is a one layer of fascia and also underneath your rhomboid and i go to the scapula then you see this is the levator scapula muscle here and it's attached 
It's not like a muscle attachment, but it's a holding that the skin. So, and also, this is uh, tr just trying to show you if I'm doing a panoramic view and then scanning from one side of the scapula at a typical rate. Usually we, we think uh, T4, T5, T6, these are the typical uh, rib. And then from the mid, from one side of the scapula and all the way to the other side, and then you're going to see, uh, finally you get a picture. I will repeat this two times, usually over the rib, then I repeat uh, one, more, one more time, and then over is the pleura. That means it's the intercostal space. So I, have, I get this one here. So, and then take a look at this. So this is a panoramic view from one side to the other side and over the rib. So you have your spinous process, you have the rib, and you have the transverse process, transverse process, costal transverse joint here. And you have the, within this layer here, you have the serratus posterior superior within this fascial plane here, okay? It's, uh, this is uh, pretty much at the uh, rhomboid major. So you've seen that, remember the rhomboid major is not attached to the scapula. It is holding the medial end and medial edge of the scapula. And that's uh, how it um, gives power to that. And you have your trapezius muscle here. It's a mid trapezius, mid trapezius to the other side. Okay. And then you also have, um, if I keep going more medial to, to the cervicus uh, posterior superior fascial plane here, then you have the yellow costellus, you have your longissimus, and then you have, uh, uh, at this point, I still not seeing the spinalis that much, but then I see the splenius, semispinalis, and the multifidite muscle, and uh, multifidite muscle should be this one, the semispinalis this one, and uh, splenius should be this one. So. All these are the, the, the muscle attached. One more time, this time I'm going to run from the pleura, just over the pleura, and then from one end of the scapula, and then to the other side. So this is an intercostal space. And uh, I, you can see, basically seeing the uh, paravertebral space. If you want to do a paravertebral space injection, should be in, within this fascial plane here. And this is the pleura on the other side. And, uh, and also you know that you have your external, internal, innermost uh, intercostal membrane and the muscles and the other side of the scapula. So we're seeing a little bit of the, um, so you have a scapula on one side, scapula on the other side, because this is an interspinous space, not seeing the spinous process. And um, you see the pleura on one end, the pleura on the other end, then you have your intercost, uh, external intercostal muscle, in, in, internal and intercostal muscle, and innermost in the intercostal membrane. And you have, uh, can you see this ligament here? This is the inferior end of that uh, costal transverse ligament. And so this this one here is um, is is a give through. Will give you a give through sensation. And then when you go into the paravertebral space, and you also, this time you're seeing the multifidite muscle very well. You're seeing that the semispinalis muscle very well, the splenius very well, and the longissimus muscle here. And you also have your iliocostalis very thin layer here, and your uh, rhomboid major muscle holding that scapula, and your infraspinatus from here, and your trapezius over the top of it. Okay. And this part usually here, Usually when you're seeing like that, it's pretty much you are going to see the spinalis very soon. This is, should be the spinalis somewhere here, okay. And looking at this, and then you have seen all this layer of muscle here. And uh, this is um, give you, giving you that this layer should be your serratus posterior superior muscle here, right here. Okay. So it's from the spinous process, but attached to the rib. How to do the um, facet joint? Um, when we do the facet joint, remember you should not see the pleura. Okay, if you see the pleura, you see the, the other end of the pleura, don't go. 
otherwise you will be puncturing the uh, the epidural space and the patient will have dural headache then your probe should be pointing straight down you should see two bony landmark and a needle coming from cranial to caudal caudal to cranial it doesn't matter to me but in usually we're teaching from caudal to cranial and then just and hitting bone bone two ends of the bone this is uh, how you're going to do the needle coming from caudal to cranial and a heating bone on the one end and a heating bone on the other end. And then you saw when you're hitting bone, it should be safe. Okay. And, uh, and usually you can retract the needle and uh, you can redirect the needle and then go into another level, which is uh, top crane, more cranial level. And at least usually you're going to treat three levels corresponding to the patient's pain. So the, the level above and the level below. And also remember not only to treat this, you, you, you are going to direct your needle a little bit more uh, lateral and then to treat the spinous process. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. Number one, your um, between the, the transverse process and then you have a lot of muscle attachment as said, the multivitae, uh, your semispinalis, your splenius, your multissimus, they all attached to this transverse process. Reason number two, you have your inter um, transversarii uh, ligament and muscles between the transverse process, also attached to the transverse process, very important. Number three, your medial branch is over the transverse process. Number four, the costal transverse joint, in fact, is uh, having a ligament is supporting blending together with the inter transversarii ligament. So all these are the reason why you need to treat the transverse process. For a patient presenting with interscapular pain like that, a lot of time what we are going to do is you can treat from medial to lateral and uh, you're going to treat several targets. So number one, the serratus posterior superior muscle is attached here and you're going to hydrodissect your way in. And this is a, remember the levator scapulae attachment. So uh, you're going to treat the levator scapulae attachment both from here all the way to the top. Okay, so, and then also this is uh, to treat the muscle attachment. After treating, the muscle attachment, you should go to the dorsal scapular nerve right here. And this is the lateral to the serratus posterior superior attachment. And then you go a little bit more medial to that. And then you treat the posterior cutaneous nerve of intercostal nerve. But, uh, but a lot of time I'm going to, uh, to treat all the way to that uh, levator scapulae attachment and hydrodissect the fascial plane between the uh, upper trapezius and uh, levator scapulae for the spinal accessory nerve and uh, and also go more this time going more medial to the serratus posterior superior attachment then you have your um, uh, posterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve okay then you just with the same needle hole but redirect your needle this time you're going to treat and remember this is the uh, trapezius, the vitus scapulae, and then the serratus posterior superior, so over this fascial plane here. And then also you treat other spinal accessory nerve, and you're going to treat underneath the uh, vitus scapulae, treat a more longer length of that dorsal scapular nerve fascial plane here. And then uh, going more, even more medial, and then to pointing really to that can you see the costal transverse joint right here and the rib and the, the see when you see the rib and the costal transverse and the transverse process at the same time you can treat several levels of uh, costal transverse joint so this is in fact a technique you can see that my needle tip is really over the costal transverse joint so it's a one needle hole more than eight targets okay for that. Uh, also, you have to make sure the patient will not uh, faint uh, when you're doing the, the injection. So you can see that apart from the costal transverse joint, 
and also go a little bit more to the transverse process as well. So I want to, to cover the whole rib area from the more lateral all the way to the costal transverse joint and the transverse process as well. So for dorsal scapular nerve, interscapular pain, and just the revision of the anatomy I've just introduced, trapezius, spinal accessory nerve, dorsal scapular nerve, dorsal scapular art nerve, dorsal scapular artery, serratus anterior. Okay, and then you have your um, long thoracic nerve on the second part, serratus posterior superior muscle. Intercostal, posterior branch of intercostal nerve. And also you have your um, iliocostellus, longissimus, all over the medial and costal transverse joint right here. Now I'm going to another one, just showing you that dorsal scapulum artery, dorsal scapulum nerve, serratus anterior, and the insertion of that um, uh, lower. Uh, of the levator scapulae, spinal accessory nerve, or upper trapezius. And also remember that a lot of time I like to map the location of dorsal scapular nerve joining on the skin here so that when you turn the probe in plane, you can you know that how to put, where to put your um, probe. And also try to take a look at that. So this, when I map the dorsal scapular nerve, which is one finger breadth from the most medial end of that scapula. This is the dorsal scapular artery. Remember, when you see the artery, that means the nerve is medial to that. So go medial and you get to that. And also you can see this one here, the levator scapulae, upper trapezius, and this is the fascial plane for that serratus posterior superior. Okay, you can have the patient side line, the, the treatment side up and then do your injection from posterior to anterior and uh, hydro dissecting your way in. And my needle is just medial to the dorsal scapular artery. And then I try to get um, to that fascial plane with the insertion out lateral to the insertion of the serratus posterior superior. And I hydro dissect and then I can go even to the inferior surface of your levator scapulae to get some of the branches uh, to the levator scapulae. And also remember this dorsal scapular nerve, apart from giving you the intercostal, I mean, for the in interscapular pain, it's also a nerve supplying the, the levator scapulae. So then you go to Another differential diagnosis of interscapular pain here, very commonly coming together, is the spinal accessory nerve entrapment. So you can see the spinal accessory nerve right here. And then you're going to hydro dissect that fascial plane underneath the, um, the tra trapezius. Okay. And then this is, um, in fact, this one here, I advise if you're frequently treating a patient with dorsal scapular nerve entrapment, get this massage chair. Because with this massage chair, the patient can lie on the massage chair and then you can do this posterior to anterior technique without the patient develop vasovagal attack. Okay, even if you develop vasovagal attack, you have a good support. Then you, you have a cardiac monitor and you see the pulsation of the patient and the blood pressure of the patient and, uh, and also keep talking to the patient to make sure they don't have any issue when they're doing that. But this is more ergonomic and you are go you're not going to tilt your head and neck and uh, it's better for the doctor, okay? And also the patient is more comfortable. Just hydro dissecting uh, again, lateral to the serratus posterior superior insertion and um, treating both the bone, bony attachment and, uh, and also above underneath the levator scapulae, and you can see that at this point, I've not seen the, um, I've not seen the, um, the, the scapula. Go back just a tiny bit here. You can see my needle tip right here, right here. But at this point, the reason I want to point it out, point out that is that this is a area you're not seeing in, um, the scapula. 
this is cranial to that like here. And then here you're, you're going to see, apart from the labetoscopy, you're also seeing the, because your, your probe is over the spinous, uh, uh, supraspinatus uh, fossa, that's why you're seeing a little bit of uh, spin, uh, serratus anterior and also the uh, supraspinatus as well. So interscapular, uh, and remember I, I told you that you can treat from medial to, to, to lateral, but this time I'm trying to treat from lateral to medial, still with the patient seated. Put the machine over the other side, and then you can see this is the serratus posterior superior attachment. And then, then you treat outside that for and just medial to the dorsal scapular artery. And this patient has the uh, dorsal scapular nerve. It's a little bit just, um, even it's superficial to the serratus posterior superior attachment, but it is um, uh, not exactly over the attach, bony attachment of the serratus posterior superior. It's just a tiny bit uh, superior, but it's more medial. Then you have to dissect all the way in for the posterior cutaneous nerve of the intercostal nerve. Then it's, uh, you can go even go more medial and then get all the way to the dorsal uh, costal transverse joint. And for the lateral branch, intermediate branch and the medial branch, and all the way to the transverse process as well. Seeing that I'm trying to, to treat all the way to the transverse process. So this is also a technique you can come in from the uh, lateral to medial. The benefit of this technique is that you can treat even more medial and you can treat even to the spinous process. But it's very hard for you to treat levitus scapula. The technique I'm show, I showed you before from the, this, point, this one here, the technique I showed you with a needle coming from medial to lateral, you have the benefit of treating the levitus scapula attachment over, the, um, over the, that um, uh, scapula, medial end of the scapula. But it's, uh, with this entry point, it's not that easy to treat over the spinous process. So that's, you have a good and bad. Uh, personally, it depends on how many targets I'm going to treat. I use, use both of them. And just depending on the, the targets I'm going to treat. And that very much depending on the history of the patient, my physical examination findings, my dry needle um, um, results of the patient, then I, I decide which way I'm going to do, whether it's like this one here, medial to lateral, and then I'm trying to treat all these targets, or I'm coming from the um, natural to medial technique. So it's really a clinical decision, okay. Of course, uh, I have showed you that the, after the costal trans, inferior costal transverse ligament, and then you can go to that paravertebral space. This is the closest point with ultrasound guidance. You can get your solution to the dorsal root ganglion. When you're injecting, apart from getting the medial branch, you also get the dorsal root ganglion, and you also get the um, all those um, intercostal nerve as well. So this is a very good, you can treat the patient with acute herbizosta or can prevent the development of the post-hepatic neuralgia. And uh, so again, you need to have a roll of towel or pillow underneath the chest. And then, then you can have the needle coming from lateral to medial. And after passing through that also transverse ligament, then you have a give through sensation right here. Then you are going to, uh, to see the pleura has been pushed down by the, by the fluid, and then that's a point of success. So a needle coming from the lateral to medial, and I advise you to use a 22 gauge two and three quarter needle. That is um, 
because this this needle is big enough to give you the deep through sensation when you're passing through the costal transverse ligament right here. So if you're using too small a needle, like a 25 gauge, two inch needle, sometimes I use that for very old lady, but this is um this is the, the needle I like to use because uh, I want to have the deep through sensation. Okay. And after the you treat usually three levels. After the three levels, then you see uh do a panoramic view again. You want to see three, at least three levels has been the pleura has been pushed forward. And so this is uh, the final result. You have treated this level, this level, and this level. You can even see the, the flow of the fluid down and or up. Okay. So for some patients, especially those patients with um, like rib fracture, and you're going to do the intercostal nerve hydrodissection or block as well, and advise you to have the edge of the, the, the probe over the midline of the lower rib, then you have your needle having uh, just uh, enough angle and then pointing to the bottom of that rib and then do your hydro dissection or doing your um, blocking. So you should be able to see that the pleura has been pushed away. And also remember, if you go more medial and into the part of the vertical space, your Intercostal nerve at that time is in the midline, it's not underneath the rib, it's not the subcostal at, at that time. So it's all it will going all the way to the paramedical space when the medial when the when the intercostal nerve had just come out, it is right in the midline. So again, if you you are interested in the technique, the next year uh, the end of the June, not this year, next year, in the end of June, we have a fresh cadaver workshop in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And um, you're welcome to join us. And you can send me an email. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Stan, thank you for that very comprehensive uh, discussion on the thoracic spine. I know uh, not everybody is. Uh, adapt to that kind of uh, anatomical structure, but it is a very good start for a lot of us to learn from that kind of technique, and especially for those who are doing a lot of interventional. And uh, I would like to find out if there is any question from our attendees at this point. Of course, they're always asking a question of what do you inject, doctors? Yes. Design? Uh, for hydro dissection, most of the time, it depends on whether the nerve is having a motor branch. Uh, usually, I, I would just use 5% dextrose because I don't want to block that uh, motor branch. So that's why I use, uh, when I do the hydro dissection, I use 5% dextrose a lot. But do remember that you have to balance the pH. The pH of the 5% dextrose usually coming to the office is a, light, is a little bit acidic. So, which is um, when you're injecting acidic 5% dextrose, the patient will feel the soreness. So I balance that with uh, sodium bicarbonate, just a few drops to that, um, uh, to the 500 mil of the, um, of the back, and then it's it's going to balance the pH. But of course, you have pH paper to, to check that. That's for the 5% dextrose. And if you're using patient's um, serum after the, doing the um, PRP centrifuge, and then I get the PPP, and which is very good hydro dissecting solution. It is also the solution you're going to get the alpha 2 macro goblin. And then using that for hydro dissection of nerves, in fact, it's a lot of time gives, gives a very good result using the PPP for hydro dissection. And uh, especially the patient, you don't want to stimulate that nerve that much. If they have a very bad neurogenic inflammation, 
just using PPP to, to do the good job and then the patient will just love it. And if I'm going to inject to the muscle attachment, to the ligament, and then I'm, usually I would change the solution to like a 15% hypertonic glucose with the local anesthetic. And if you're just using PRP, it doesn't matter, just using PRP. Okay, and um, if I'm going to do um, um, a joint injection a lot of time, I for thoracic facet, I still stick to the 15% uh, hypertonic glucose or PRP, that should be enough. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah, there's another question here. Uh, this is a pretty serious question. Mm -hmm. First one is, how common is myofascial pain syndrome? Mm -hmm. And can we treat trigger points with dry needling in deep muscles of the back? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. In fact, of course, uh, myofascial trigger point is very common. I believe uh, every one of us has some degrees of uh, myofascial trigger point and myofascial pain syndrome, so-called. It depends on whether the trigger point is active or latent. And the latent trigger point when we feel that our upper trapezius squeeze it, okay, a lot of time you're going to feel a tender spot, or soreness part, and that when you squeeze, you probably can treat, trigger a little bit of referral pain all the way up to the to a face, to a head. So that's common. And But to me, when you find a trigger point, remember you need, this is just a presentation. You have to find wide, find out why the patient developed that trigger point. Patient developing trigger point, usually because of poor biomechanics or biotensequity. So it's the, the muscle skeletal system is having some anomalies, having some dysfunction that the muscle is trying to compensate and that create trigger point or the nerve supplying that muscle, it depends on which one is, which is egg and which is hand, whether egg first or hand first. Okay, so whether the nerve is trapped first, that create a motor supply problem to the muscle, or it is the muscle become so tight and that uh, create excessive friction between the muscle layers and that create the nerve entrapment and eventually that the neuromuscular system is going to have trouble. So that's why when you're treating the, um, when I'm treating the um, myofascial trigger point, I, apart from doing the dry needling, I always treat the nerves supplying that muscle. So I always hydrodissect the nerve supplying that muscle. A lot of time when I'm hydrodissecting the nerve without touching the muscle, the muscle's trigger point is gone immediately. Okay, so that's to me is a proof that the nerve probably is the primary cause for that myofascial trigger point. But it's, uh, if you're doing nerve hydrodissection with only 5% dextrose, because you're not using the local anesthetics, and then the trigger point is still there, so that means something has persist going on inside the muscle. That's probably a very active trigger point. You can use dry needling to that, but remember after treating the dry needling, you have to find out, um, you have to stretch the muscle and you also have to, uh, to do a corrective rehabilitation exercise correct the posture, prevent the patient from coming back, from, from, the, from that um, uh, biomechanical anomalies from coming back a lot of time, say the upper trapezius or the levator scapula. A lot of time, the patient is having a very poor posture and uh, it's a point protruding head and neck forwards, just like what I was doing during the presentation. That's the biomechanical anomalies uh, going to precipitate uh, development, development of uh, myofascial trigger point over the upper trapezius, levator scapulae, uh, sternocleidomastoid muscles, and a lot of this. And of course, after knowing that, you need to pay attention. If the patient developing upper trapezius trigger point, 
you also have to pay attention that the spinal accessory nerve that supplies the upper trapezius and you know that why the nerve is called spinal accessory nerve. Even you know that the is from the medulla. And it has some final contribution to that nerve. And it goes together um, in, um, inside the spinal cord and then to the pons and then to medulla. And then at that point, it joins the accessory nerve and then to supply, to come out together with the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve and the jugular foramen. That's the reason why this nerve is termed spinal accessory nerve. So if you have C1 to C4 spinal problems, the facet problems, no wonder the patient develop so-called the spinal accessory nerve dysfunction and eventually develop upper trapezius trigger point. So if you're not treating the origin, that means you're not treating the C1, two, C2, C2, three, and C, C3, four facet. And this, especially the C2, three facet is very common, very, very common. So these, these patients find the uh, malfacial trigger point will not go away. So it just come, keep coming back. So this, in fact, I, it, initially I do not want to touch on this too much because I want to, to, to get to that when I was, um, uh, giving the cervical spine lecture. So let's come back to doing the cervical spine. I hope I'll answer your question. Uh, Dr. Stan, uh, many believe that the dorsal scapular nerve is a pure motor nerve. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, uh, why do we hydrodissect the dorsal scapular nerve uh, instead uh, of hydrodissecting the cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve? Yeah. In fact, the, I have not seen any nerve in the body which is purely motor and purely sensory. Uh, if you talk to Dr. Professor Morigo, I believe he will uh, agree with me. And uh, I have not seen any, any of that. So all the nerves in the body our God provide us, they all have sensory and motor contribution. It just depends on whether they are more motor or more sensory. So that's why um, for interscapular pain, a lot of time, this dorsal scapular nerve is one of the differential diagnoses and posterior cutaneous nerve is another one. Spinal accessory nerve is the third and even some other like uh, the uh, lateral branch of the, of the dorsal, uh, dorsal branch. And uh, it's also a contributing factor for that. Even the nerve supplying the uh, iliocostellus, nerve supplying the longissimus, they all carry some of the nerve fibers causing this so-called interscapular pain. So that's why if you want to treat an interscapular pain very well, you have to, apart from treating the biomechanics, and you need to treat all these nerves. Okay, Dr. Samar Kumar, would you like to ask this, this questions? You have a lot of questions right here. So mm -hmm. would you like to yeah, uh, ask I can see the he's, uh, writing a lot of the questions. <laughs> is, uh... Hello. Anyway, uh, Doctor. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your concern, and it was a wonderful answer. One of the best answers I've ever got on my facial pain syndromes, and I appreciate and thank for your deep understanding of the subject. Uh, mm -hmm. Another case I had uh, come across, which was, uh, you know, looking like a neurolipoma. I mean, I wasn't sure, and the patient had pain for over 20, 25 years, and this was corresponding to the anterior cutaneous branch of an intercostal nerve. So my question is that, is it, uh, uh, you know, it, could it be a cause of a pain in a patient who could have an underlying, underdiagnosed or undiagnosed neurolipoma? 
and is it uh, i mean have you come across any such case because this patient has been uh, visiting many centers and uh, his uh, disorder is undiagnosed i can send you the images of this case yes i think this patient um if the patient has seen so many doctors and so in so many centers uh and then if you're suspecting the patient is having a neurolipoma which is in fact a diagnosis you need to have a very good image and then to see whether that is a really a neuroma or a lipoma i think the the best way still to uh take an mri if you have scanned that several times and then uh, you cannot draw a conclusion because lipoma should be fatty in content and ultrasound it should look hyper echoic neuroma is hypo echoic it should is uh, but it's a neuro lipoma that means it's containing nerve tissues and fatty tissues edible tissues that that is a uh, makes the, the the diagnosis difficult the best way is still to take an mri you can use a 3t high resolution mri really just focus on that um structure and of course you can do a diagnostic block using 0.5 cc of uh, local anesthetic 0.5 cc just tiny bit and try to block that whether you can whether you can block it or not if uh, if blocking it the patient still have pain making that the treatment that this is this may not be the cause of the patient's pain so i think you need to have a very good diagnosis before you treat the patient thanks a lot thanks a lot and uh, one more question uh, this would be the last one mm -hmm. uh, i have come across patients of course who have myofascial pain syndromes they have facial component uh, involved as well where there could be densification or fibrosis and uh, of course we need to differentiate and because the treatment would be different but in the back region i could not really differentiate between the two in any of the cases because the anatomy of the fascia uh, in the back region is totally different than what we find around the muscles especially in the limbs so how do we really come to a conclusion wherein the facial component is involved in back region along with the muscle component in myofascial pain syndrome and uh, exactly any, any criteria any role of elastography or any other criteria to uh, comment on the facial uh, component of myofascial pain syndrome here um you are talking about how to differentiate the deep fascia of the back and yeah, yeah. also the how to how to differentiate whether the pain is coming from the fascia or is coming from the muscle yeah yeah and densification versus fibrosis how do we differentiate because the facial anatomy here is very complex it is not uh, like trial or typical trial or uh, structure what we find in limb muscles so here any fascia uh, any any you know uh, especially around the muscles here uh, then is it uh, involved along with the muscle in the pain syndrome or any facial pathology how do we diagnose the anatomy here is totally different exactly the facial anatomy in fact i advise you to read um uh sure. dr tom right tom myers work uh -huh. tom myers and then there is a, a, a book called fascia and i read their their work and i trying to to see um which fascia are really um uh, interrelated with each other the best yeah. way to find to treat to differentiate fascia and my fascial mm -hmm. trigger point is you uh when you have a very good hydrodissection technique don't use local anesthetics just use 5% dextrose or even normal saline when your needle goes hydrodissecting your way to that fascia between the muscles don't don't do that within the muscles that is between your needle should be between the muscles just injecting with fluid say when your needle is between the rhomboid and uh deeper layer okay then you hydrodissecting or if your needle is between the trapezius and rhomboid and hydrodissecting so and then you 
when you see the fluid with no localness anesthetic, of course you numb the skin, but inside the body, do not use local anesthetics and just hydrodisecting with the fluid. When you see the tracking of the fluid kind of freely flowing up and the patient's pain is gone, that means that is really a fascial problem and then causing the patient's pain. And remember, a lot of sensory fibers to the muscle is inside the fascia, it's not inside the muscle. The mu inside the muscle is the motor fibers and the Golgi tendons. But if you're going to see the, the muscle, the, the sensory supply to the muscle is in, within the fascia. So that's the reason why we can use this technique to treat even the patient with rock, muscle rupture. Okay, if you're a patient with tennis leg, you have a rupture of the gastro, uh, medial gastronemius, you still can hydrodissect the fascia to take away the pain and the patients can get up right away, immediately walking normally. So that's the reason why you can use hydrodissection and then to treat and differentiate whether this is a myofascial trigger point or due to a fascia. If the patient is having trigger point problem without having a fascial problems, usually they coexist. If the patient is purely muscle trigger point, doing this fascial hydrodissection, it will not relieve patient's pain. The patient's pain is still there and you still have to do the, uh, the so-called uh, injection into the muscle or your, even your needle touching that um, top band and then the patient will develop twitching and then getting a relief. And, uh, and after that, you do a, your stretching, you do your, do your work. So remember to differentiate that by hydrodissection. And I hope um, you can, you have uh, listened to my lectures about hydrodissection before. And even today, I, when I try to demonstrate how you can hydrodissect the serratus posterior, um, serratus muscle, above and below and hydrodissecting between the upper trapezius and the levator scapulae and between the levator scapulae and underneath and, and, then, and then also the serratus posterior superior muscle and then these are the hydrodissection technique because I'm treating that fascia by hydrodissection. In fact, if you're joining the University of Toronto, the ISURA, the International Society of Ultrasound and Regional Anesthesia. Uh, this uh, coming meeting in June in Toronto, I have a lecture about uh, hydrodissection of fascia and then treating the fascia. So I hope you can uh, join us because I'm going to talk a lot about the fascial hydrodissection at that time. And uh, I have examples uh, from head to toes and talking about hydrodissection of fascia. So hope you can uh, join us at that time. Yeah, sure, 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 thank you. Thank you. Dr. Shan, thank yes. you very much for your time. And I know you are so tired. I can see you're so tired. You have been working the whole time, the whole yes. day. Yes. And uh, you're again speaking tonight. So we really appreciate your uh, precious time with us tonight in this uh, very important lecture on the thoracic spine and hope to see you soon. Yes. You take care always. God bless all Especially of you. With, uh, very challenging times. Thank God you. God bless you always and take care. God bless you. Bye bye. And uh, yeah, bye. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thanks a lot, Dr. Castro and uh, the speaker. Many, many thanks. Wonderful talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you too. Thank you.